Good afternoon, Roy Oppenheim here on behalf of Oppenheim Law and Weston Title. I say this every week, but it's week 22, uh, nonstop consecutive weeks that we have been Zooming at noon to talk about how we're trying to get through this whole crisis together and what this all means for us uh, individually, our families, our society, our business. And uh, today we're going to be talking about UV light during COVID-19, fad or fab. And um, it's a very interesting topic, and uh, I think you'll all find this very, very engaging. Uh, we have two great uh, guests with us today. Uh, we can uh, let me just read you their bios, if I may. They're, they're fascinating. Uh, doc, Dr. Uh, Rakisha uh, Guduru holds a PhD in electrical and computer science engineering with a focus on medicine. He helped research and develop nanotechnologies for ovarian cancer and neurological disorders, and was awarded several patents. Most recently, Dr. Guduru realize the need for guaranteed safe water consumption and the problem that single-use plastic water bottles pose to the global environment. And he created the crazy cap by implementing deep UV LED technology into a practical water bottle. He started changing the way consumers drink water forever. Now Dr. Goudreau continues to use UV lead technology in the fight against viruses and germs and specifically the coronavirus. Scott, also a friend, is the regional director of Germ Busters. Scott's Florida, uh, Scott's, uh, is the South Florida, uh, a regional director of this disinfection company that uses a combination of UVC germicidal light and EPA registered antimicrobial disinfectant, offering sanitation coverage that meets the EPA's criteria to use against SARS COVID 2. Prior to Germ Buster, Scott was CEO and founder of, of, of Hollow to Go, Hollow to Go where, his, where he led research and design for the first life size interactive holographic kiosks. Since COVID 19, Scott pivoted his engineers from telling stories with light to killing viruses with light. Very cute. And I will say the holograms were, were absolutely fascinating. And uh, I can tell you that uh, um, it's been uh, really very, uh, very interesting to see Scott make this pivot. Uh, of course, I want to thank, as usual, my wife and my law partner, Ellen Polowski, Jeff Sherman, who's handling the controls today, Mia Singh, my senior associate, and, uh, and Paula Vergara, who helped uh, put this presentation together. Uh, First thing I want to do talk about is that uh, some people think UV lighting is maybe a scam or it's snake oil. And it's kind of interesting because in the New York City subway system, uh, to get the, the, sub, the subway riders back every single night uses UV lighting to, to cleanse and kill bacteria and viruses. And this is just a picture of what they've been doing now for, for weeks and months. I will say that uh, you know when we started uh, promoting this seminar, uh, there were some uh, online services that, that thought that by even tying the word UV light to viruses and um, germs uh, somehow was not necessarily uh, consistent with good practices. However, as we go through this today, you, we will see that both the CDC and Harvard, many other institutions, as well as the New York City subway system are using these systems every, every single day. Uh, so we're gonna teach you how to distinguish from snake oil to true UV lighting systems that, that, that could get us out of, out of this pickle as we await a vaccine. But let's first go through the weekly economic update. Uh, let's look at local unemployment percentages. The dark colors are the colors where there's concentrated unemployment. As we can see along the coast, particularly Hialeah, some parts of Fort Lauderdale, uh, and, and down maybe in the Homestead area, uh, we have concentrated uh, areas of unemployment. As we move towards the west, we're seeing that, that it's less significant, in part that's because many people are able to telecommute and work from home uh, in some parts of those uh, suburban parts of the community. Um, next page. Uh, this is absolutely fascinating. This was a graph from earlier this week that I, I thought really kind of tells it all. If we can take the cursor, if that's possible, I don't know if we can, can we grab a cursor. Um, but if we if we take a look here, we can see this this uh, big blue slope on, on the left shows uh, the creation of jobs since the last recession up to 20, 21 million people. And then we see in a matter of days how that number just completely collapsed. Then we see in a matter of weeks, uh, we were able to regenerate a good chunk of, of uh, or maybe a third of those of those jobs. And then between June and July, we've seen a very steep, steep increase. If we take that number back sideways to the left, we see that we're kind of going back to about 2014 or 2013, where we are in terms of, of number of jobs that we are creating. Uh, the question is how quickly will we be able to continue this slope up? Will it take two years, three years, four years, five years to, to get to where we, we, we currently are? Or will it happen even, even faster? The jobs that, that were created were the ones that, that lost the most number of people, leisure and hospitality, retail, professional services, less so being, being impacted, but also not creating as many jobs, healthcare, 
and, and, and then other service areas. Um, now, if we go to the unemployment rate, we're going to see that uh, July's numbers uh, show that recovery is not happening as fast. June's numbers were strong, but July's weren't. The reason being is that a lot of uh, communities that opened up, opened up too soon and then had to scale back. We saw that, for example, in Fort Lauderdale with curfews and limitations on, on clubs, restaurants, bars, therefore, again, creating uh, lack of opportunity for people to get their, their jobs back. Uh, if we look at the two colors, June is one color, July is the other, we're seeing the distinction in, in, in job creation. So for example, retail, we saw that there was a, a lot of, of jobs created in June, but not so much in July. Professional services about the same. Leisure and hospitality, of course, has the greatest number of jobs created in June, less so in July. Next slide, please. Decline in recovery per, per industry. So, okay. uh, in terms of declining and, and recovering, we're, we're seeing, uh, if we look at the big, big V at the bottom, that is leisure and hospitality in terms of, of the number of, of jobs uh, that, that, that were lost and then recovered. And then if we look at the other jobs uh, sectors, we see that, that the declines were precipitous, but not as significant. But, but leisure and hospitality by far, by far, took it, took it on the chin. And of course, that also would have to include transportation, like the cruise industry, as, as well as the airlines. Uh, next page, please. Uh, okay, so this is a very interesting slide, and we're seeing here that uh, while uh, initially economists were closely tracking the number of initial unemployment claims, now four months into the pandemic, the concern is the number of weeks people have been unable to find a job. So we look at the very bottom, we're seeing that, that uh, in fact, uh, a lot of people have been unemployed just for five weeks, and then it jumps to, to five to 14 weeks and 15 plus weeks. And of course, the biggest concern is the people who are unemployed for 15 plus weeks, which is the orange slide. And that's probably the one that, that, that is a biggest concern to economists and, and policymakers. Next slide. In terms of long-term recovery, the big issue, of course, in terms of demographics and, and different groups are probably the millennials, who, who not only are taking it on the chin now while they're at, at literally, literally at the, the, the peaks of their career, and millennials, by the way, are for those folks who were born between 1980-81 and 1995 or 1996. Um, and so those folks, unfortunately had to endure the last economic crisis uh, during uh, their uh, high school, college, or, or early career development years. And now when they got through it and, and seem to be getting back on their feet are taking a second hit. And, and many economists are suggesting that it's gonna to be tough for this particular group to, to, to literally overcome this. And this is a, a perfect example. Percentage of households that wouldn't be able to go back one please. Percentage of households uh, that wouldn't be able to pay for a $400 emergency. We've seen that the millennials are, are, are the highest. Gen Xs, uh, many of them still are in school, high school, college, so it would be understandable for them. Boomers seem to have less of an issue, and then all is the average. But, but if we see that the, the folks that, that would have the biggest issue would be the millennials. And under that average cumulative loss of earnings from 2007 to 2017, again, as we said, the millennials took, took the, the, the biggest hit. Gen X, many of them weren't working. Boomers, some were already retired. So by definition, the millennials are, 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 are taking it That's the worst. Um, there is some improvement in hiring. Obviously, uh, what we're seeing is that uh, uh, there, there have been a change in, in, in payrolls and that uh, food service folks are, are the ones that, that are recovering the fastest because they took the largest hit. Uh, and then there's some areas that aren't, aren't happening that fast, like amusements, gambling, and recreation, because those areas are still completely shut down. Child care services, of course, uh, the, the same thing. Um, Next page. Uh, pandemic uptake, I want to do this real quickly. Uh, Florida, as many of you know, uh, was doing very poorly for uh, an extended period of time. But right now, we're, we're seeing a moving average number uh, starting to come down, bringing us back close to where we were in the middle of June. So uh, the July and early August highs are hopefully behind us. And, and with social distancing, people wearing more masks and, and, and occasionally, uh, uh, reducing the number of, of hours that, that certain establishments are allowed to, to operate, we have seen uh, a little bit more control of, of, of the crisis. In terms of the vaccine tracker, this is very interesting. Last week we showed that there were 140 preclinical trials, now 135. Uh, the biggest change is in phase three. If we skip there, we're seeing that there are were six in phase three last week. Now we have eight in phase three. In, in phase three and approvals, we have uh, still only one that's approved. Of course, you also have the Russians that claim they, they have one now. But I would guarantee you that they have not gone through this, this, this whole process the way we have. And so uh, a lot of this is, is just uh, wait and see and smoke and mirrors. 
Next page. I want to get our, our, our two guests on, on, on the phone, if, if possible. Uh, Scott and Rakesh, R- 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 if you're there, please. If you can come on. Yes. Mr. There you are. Great, hey. great. Hey, Roy. Hi, Scott. Hi, Rakesh. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I think it's an absolutely fascinating topic because we want to distinguish fact from fiction, you know, and, 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 and really explain to people what, what the story is and how UV lighting works and what you all are trying to do to promote it and how you're, you're, you're helping expand the economy and employ people with, with, with this process. Uh, Rakesh, Rakesh, I'll let you go first, if, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So thank you so much, Rai, for uh, organizing this. This is, I think, a great opportunity for us to tell uh, all the users and even educate consumers how UV lighting can actually benefit, which, which is toxic-free, chemical-free, and very easy to use. And uh, it's, I think it's, it's a game-changing technology. And considering right now we have a UV technology in the UVC space, which which is uh, toxic free and made in much environmentally friendly manner. So, so we have uh, we are in the perfect uh, uh, time to tackle coronavirus related disinfection problems. Uh, so, uh, what are can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, you can hear you fine. Let, let me just let me just ask you. I mean, yeah. because most people don't understand UV light. They they understand that you know when you buy. Uh, Sunscreen, that's for UVA, UVB, and you guys today are talking about UVC, right? Yeah, yeah. Ultra UV, ultraviolet C. So explain what the use of ultraviolet C is as it relates to killing germs. Yeah. So pretty much UV light consists of uh, a broad uh, range of light, which is from 200 to 400 nanometers. Uh, the specific uh, frequent uh, wavelength we are talking is 200 to 280, which is UVC, which has maximum germicidal effect. So what does it mean is, that means when you shine a microorganism with this wavelength of light, it can break the, the DNA uh, bonds and form a, a timer dimer forms, we call it as, so which, which is what uh, stops replication of this microorganism like bacteria, virus and all. And in, in, it, inact, in, it inactivates the cell. So when cell is no longer active, it's kind of doesn't pose any threat uh, like an infection or anything. So that's how UV light deactivates uh, uh, or kills uh, this microorganism. So, hey, thanks. Scott, I want to talk to you how you fell into this because it's hysterical, you know, how you were you know, using yeah. uh, a certain type of technology to do advertising. The next thing you know, you're a germ buster. Right, right, right. Well, uh, you know, lighting technology fabrication has always fascinated me. I mean, we were doing uh, holographic displays. You can see uh, our logo back here. But, uh, you know, when the trade uh, trade show industry came to a halt with uh, COVID, uh, we, you know, we still had all these connections, uh, you know, overseas. And, you know, my engineers were like, well, what are we going to do? Because the trade show industry is not coming back. So we really started to look at, okay, well, how can we, help the community, how can we help, you know, take what we know and, and apply it. So we really started looking at UBC light. We started looking at some of the best um, uh, uh, bulb manufacturers out there and how we could basically uh, bring these over here, fabricate uh, disinfection devices. And that's kind of how we fell into it. We were telling stories of light and now we're killing germs of light. Okay, I'm, I have a question here from, from the public. Uh, I still don't understand how ultraviolet light can kill germs. Is this being used in hospitals? Is this on public transits? I mean, uh, so the answer is yes, it's on public transits, but let's talk about hospitals using it. And, and if they're not using it, why are they not using it yet? Rakesh? Well, yeah, pretty much it's uh, in, in hospitals and in traditional way, uh, UV light used for sterilization since decades, but what we are talking is efficacy right now. What we can use a very do- low dose of energy and can achieve a maximum sterilization effect with this special wavelength of light. So in general, UV light is known to be uh, 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 having the sterilization effect since not, it's not, uh, not something new, but people were scared to use UV light because it can uh, cause skin cancer and other radiation related health has- hazards. So that's why the application was very minimal. So whenever you turn on the UV light in a room, people has to vacate the, the place and stuff like that. So 
with UVC, what it's doing is uh, with uh, with considering that limitations, what UVC is doing is you can achieve much better effect of sterilization with a low low power or low energy density because it has that maximum uh, 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 maximum efficacy you know that's uh, pretty much it. and how about the eyes isn't isn't there an issue with the uv possibly you know causing problems with with, yeah. with your eyes if, if if it's too bright or yes too yes uh, for even with uvc if you are very close to the uh, eye uh, it's still dangerous, uh, but if you're indirectly looking at it, it's kind of uh, uh, not dangerous at all because it doesn't penetrate the uh, epidermis of the skin or even in the eye tissue because it's uh, when when it hits the skin, it only penetrates. Uh, it's completely absorbed in the dead tissue of the skin, you know, so it doesn't penetrate until the energy is too high or exposure time is too much. So, so Scott, I mean, you're a marketing guy, first and foremost. Yeah. How do we tell people to avoid the snake oil that's on Amazon and online in terms yeah. of all the UV lighting out there? And if people put like a UV light in their HVAC system, I don't know if you have one, but what should, what kind of light bulb, what kind of light should be emitted so we know it's the right kind? Sure, sure. I mean, I've got a, uh, this is an APCO brand right here. Uh, I've got one of the uh, HVAC systems, and they have a bulb right here, which is about a 30-watt bulb. Uh, but to to test these things, um, uh, like including like something like this, you can go to a website, and it's called UVC Dosimeter. And uh, Ernesto, can you get a close-up shot of this? Probably not, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. So what this is, is uh, it's a sticker. It's a photo... Uh, sensitive sticker and it's only sensitive to UVC light. So when you get it, it's yellow. And then the key metric to uh, see right here is this orange color right here, which means once it turns orange, it's been exposed to 25 millijoules per centimeter squared. Now why that's important is Boston University uh, did a, a recent study with Signify and they determined that to kill SARS-CoV-2, uh, you needed to uh, expose for 22 millijoules per centimeter squared. So I'm gonna quickly show you guys just a demonstration of how to determine if, if something's legit or not. So I'm gonna actually turn on one of our handheld devices and uh, I'm gonna put on my safety glasses. Of course, it's like looking in the sun. You don't look in the sun and you don't expose your skin to this. But I'm gonna quickly come over this sticker and it's already turned orange. So I'm gonna turn this down. It's actually pink. So right here, we can tell that the exposure or dosage for this is somewhere between 50 and 100 millijoules per centimeter square. Now, once it gets to 100 millijoules per centimeter squared, that's like hospital disinfection. That means all pathogens have been killed. So I'm gonna come back over here. I'm gonna go back over it. And now it's completely pink. Right here, for so, 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 so what kind of light bulb would I want to put in my HVA system to do exactly what you just showed and how would I get that? Well, um, what's on the market right now, like this is the top brand, this is a, a 30 watt bulb. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're looking into is actually redesigning it because, um, I mean, not to sell ourselves, but you know, our bulb is significantly bigger. Uh, it's a 300 watt bulb, uh, but with these bulbs right here, when I was talking to an APCO rep, he says that 40 to 60% of the air is caught uh, using this system. So um, we're gonna get some more stickers here and we'll, uh, we'll test this thing, but this should be adequate to um, purify the air that's coming through your home. And, and Rakesh, your product is more to clean small surfaces, is that right? Yes, uh, this is most, more, this is our product, so our UVC is built in the bottle cap itself. It's more for convenience when you're traveling, for example, you're in the plane, you want to quickly disinfect the tray or 
your laptop keyboard uh, or a cell phone, which is very comes in handy. You just activate it like this, the UV LED turns on and you go over the surface uh, and pretty much sanitize it, which is, this is a super low power. It's just uh, ranging from depending on, on the mode you activate, it ranges from 10 milliwatt to 20 milliwatt energy, which takes about to disinfect the surface of 10 uh, square meters, like an iPad, about four minutes, you know, it has to be stationary, yeah. So you'd have to, so if it was my phone, I would have yes. to do yes. this for about two or three minutes? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. If you can even ha hold it stationary, for example, put it like this and do it, it has a, a wide beam angle, about uh, 120 degrees. So pretty much if you have, if you put like three to four minutes away, uh, three to four inches away for like three minutes, you can disinfect the surface size of uh, like a 10 inch iPad. I have some questions, I have some questions yeah. for the two of you. Uh, why is this not used everywhere uh, by everyone in terms of disinfection instead of cleaning materials and practices? Is it because of cost? Well, it, it, yeah, we're catching my answer first. I mean, I think the main thing is you can't really be in the room right now with UVC. You do have to protect your eyes. You can't, uh, you shouldn't have your skin exposed. Um, there is a new product coming out called FAR UVC, which is supposed to be uh, where humans can be around it. But the, uh, that still remains to be seen if that's gonna be a legitimate source of uh, disinfection. I, I wanna go back to the PowerPoint just for a second because there was uh, a page, um, I think, let me see, the page before that, yeah. Um, where, where there was an article uh, in the New York Times about a bar in Seattle that was having these blue lights, these UVC lights up pretty high up. Um, and uh, it seemed to, uh, at least the, the employees and the, and the customers liked it. Uh, but um, I guess the question is, uh, is it safe or is there still potential uh, you know, health risk? And I guess that's, that's the real question. Uh, and that one of the questions one of the attendees today is asking is, does the doctor believe that this would work in the same? Is there any potential liability in using this in public? And the answer is, I, I guess we don't know really the answer just yet, right? I mean, a lot of these companies are saying they're using FAR UVC. Uh, when I talk to the company rep for these uh, dissimilar cards, they have not yet come out with any sort of verification that they work. So we're really going on the uh, claims of the company. Uh, even the radio meters, which is another tool to use to verify if UVC works, they're not actually uh, capable of verifying if uh, FAR UVC works. So it's kind of you're left to the company's claims if FAR UVC works. Those, those places you're seeing with bulbs in public, they have to be FAR UVC. If they're running uh, regular UVC, they, they are exposing themselves to um, uh, litigation there. So let me just add this. We know that sunlight has UVC, and we know that the, generally the, the virus doesn't do particularly well outdoors under normal circumstances. So we know that the UV, UVC works in some circumstances. The, the, the question is, what does the wavelength have to be if you're using a, 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 you know, a manufactured bulb? Now, you all were telling me about 265 nanometers has to be the width, the width of, the, of the wavelength. Is that, is that right, Rakesh? Yes. Uh, so yeah. it, it, what happens is, the sun has all kinds of uh, UV bands, A, B, C, but uh, when, it, when it reaches uh, to the earth through the atmosphere, UVC is completely absorbed by the atmosphere. So not, almost no measurable quantity falls on the earth. So mainly A, A, A and B is what we are all getting exposed, which is very harmful for all of us. So, so it's just the high energy of A and B, that's what causes disinfection. But in, in the, these LEDs, we are using a very specific uh, band of light, which has that maximum toxic effects through, the, through this microbes, uh, like pathogens, viruses, and all. So, yeah. and let me ask Scott, do you know if the World Health Organization, I, I know you said the CDC has chimed in, but has the WHO chimed in yet on, on the effect, efficacy of UV light? CDC has best practices for uh, UV light, and they recommend the optimal germicidal wavelength to be 265. Um, they have a few other recommendations as far as, um, you know, keeping the bulbs clean, um, you know, the, 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 the time that it takes uh, to disinfect the surface. But um, there's still more studies that need to be done on CDC. 
from the CDC. They haven't really uh, done any recent studies on UV. So the most information you can find is best practices and 265 being the optimal wavelength seems to be the best information you get from CDC on UV. And, and the WHO has or has not chimed in at all on this? Uh, I'm not aware of it. Rakesh, maybe you know? Uh, excuse me, can, can you ask me that question again? Has the World Health Organization taken a position on UV lighting yet at all in terms of what works, what doesn't work, or not? I mean, uh, there, there are a few articles that, uh, which they are general, in general referring to, but the specific studies have I didn't come across, but one of the, our manufacturers, which is we are using LED from Seoul Bios, it's a Korean company. They conducted their own studies with the certified labs and they showed that it kills about 99% of coronavirus, this particular LED we are using with, for 20 seconds of exposure with three inch uh, apart distance. But in that study, they haven't been mentioned the energy density, which is what I was looking for. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, as besides that, I didn't see any other, uh, of course, BBC wrote an article, the CDC says U.S. government has the data to show that it, uh, it works, but because the virus uh, is so new and there are no uh, protocols or standards established, so it is not distributed across all these testing laboratories, but I think the now uh, typical uh, peer reviewed article takes about you know six to twelve months to uh, to. Well, I, hopefully you'll find someone who'll be able to do some studies with your own with, with your own products, which would be fantastic. Yes, yeah, I've been looking for several labs actually. I, I want to one more time ask any of the folks out there if they have any more questions. We only have about thirty minutes, thirty seconds left, and I want to thank everyone first. But let's see. Uh, we'll be quite for, oh. Uh, Will it be required for commercial real estate to have these devices? I, I, I think it's too soon for that. I think it's too soon for government to require this. I mean, I think we a lot more study has to be done. It seems to me that what you all are suggesting is that no harm, no foul. There's probably much more upside to doing this. The downside, especially if we can take one of these magic cards, Scott, that you have that shows that, that, that uh, we're able to destroy these microorganisms that we can't see uh, and that it works. I mean, it seems to be, and if the New York City subway system is using it and it's working for them, obviously it should work for all of us uh, in our homes and offices and particularly in schools and hospitals. So um, I want to thank both of you, uh, Rakesh, you know, uh, crazy cap is, you know, it's crazy. And uh, I know you developed it for people who like to be outdoors and go camping and have green water, lake water. And next thing you know, the water is green and portable and drinkable. And Scott, you know, you your holograms and advertising were great, but but this you know you're gonna leave a, a lasting, uh, hopefully, uh, impression on humanity if we can if you can pull this off. And uh, we want to thank you for for your your, your insightfulness, both of you, both of you. Uh, again, just a, a small plug for both the law firm Oppenheim Law. We've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, our firm is here to help you service your needs. Uh, it's tough on a lot of landlords right now, a lot of tenants. I'm well aware of all the issues that. Uh, that everyone is having, and, and uh, we're trying to help as many people as we possibly can. On the title company side, uh, you know, this is a, a seller's market. There are a lot more folks who want to buy right now than want to sell. Listings are low, but there are a lot of buyers coming in from all over the world that just want the space and beauty, that particularly that South Florida has, but also in other places where, where homes have become a premium and spaces, indoor spaces have become such a premium as, as we all work from home and try and distance ourselves socially, uh, you know, during the course of the day. And uh, of course, mortgage rates are at, at historical lows. Uh, if you haven't considered refinancing, you ought to do so. You should call our title company and we'll be glad to assist you. Everything is done remotely. You don't have to have personal interaction face to face if you don't want. And, uh, you know, we, we've all adjusted ourselves to, to the new reality here. Scott, uh, I want to thank you. Rakesh, I want to thank you. Uh, we'll see you all next week, Tuesday, 12 noon, for our 23rd version of Zoom at Noon with Roy Oppenheim, sponsored by the law firm of Oppenheim Law and our title company, Western United. Thank you guys so much for- Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank a great- you so much. Bye. Bye.